All right, Uma Fight Camp. Uh, in this video, I want to uh, actually answer a question. Uh, so you can determine whether or not you want to stick around. I'll tell you what that question uh, is or was. The question essentially came on the heels of me saying that me being 5'7 uh, was a blessing for me. And a gentleman wanted to know why I considered it to be a blessing. All right, and why I considered to be myself to be fortunate. Uh, to be 5'7". Alright, so in this video I'm going to explain. Alright, and I'm also going to tell you about a situation that happened not even to, uh, about, uh, started about two weeks ago. And it culminated last week. Alright, that kind of gives an idea of why I'm not very tolerant of a lot of talk about people who kick at the air or, or things of that nature. Right, it might give you an idea. This particular thing that happened will give you an idea of the kind of training that I do and how seriously I take it. All right. Okay. So here we go. Um, first of all, I think that I'm very fortunate to be five seven for several reasons. One is because there are a lot of people who are in denial about training. All right. They're in denial about training, and one reason why they can be in denial essentially is because uh, they may have a certain height a certain weight that uh, kind of keeps people at bay and therefore they can be in denial they don't necessarily have to prove themselves they're not tested because people don't feel confident testing them for me personally up until the time I was about 15 I was average height by the time I was at least 17 I was about an inch or two below average height and then it escalated from there on uh, I think in the last 10 years or so I've been probably the average height in America has been maybe 5'10 or so in the last 10 years, 5'10", 5, 5'11", 5, uh, and me being 5'7", you can see how long that I have actually been uh, below the average. Not a midget, of course, but below the average, and I've been less than average height um, for at least uh, 30 years, all right? Now, that worked to my benefit because there were things that I had to learn, and I did not have time to um, delude myself. So. When you look at a lot of people who talk about kicking high and they go on YouTube and they look at these high kicks or, you know, people kicking high and these side kicks and these jumping, spinning back kicks and these kind of things or laying down in the guard or having very fancy boxing styles and doing a lot of exotic things. When you look at those people, it's sort of like when you have a lover, right? You have a wife, you have a girlfriend, whatever, right? And they're beautiful. Your friends, your family says they'd see them with other guys, right? I mean, you know, they could be a prostitute on the side when you're not around, right? But you're in denial because you love them and they're beautiful, right? That's how it is with a lot of people. That's how it is with a lot of people on YouTube, right? A lot of people have an issue. You've spent a lot of money learning Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? So all you want to do is lay around. If somebody tells you laying in the guard is ridiculous, then you say, thumbs down to save Carmen, He's such an asshole. You know, he's such a creep. He's so arrogant because you're trying to justify spending a mere fortune, spending a fortune on Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu techniques, right? So now you have to justify doing it. Or you're a great kicker, right? And, you, and you're just stretching. You stretch so much. I'm in a full split also, you know? But I'm in a full split for flexibility, not so I can kick some try to throw a jump spinning back kick against somebody who has a switchblade, okay? But there are people who spend a lot of time kicking, and it's a big deal, and they just love the kicking and the kicking and this, and they got so many YouTube viewers, and, you know, and they, they, you know, they've done so much talking on YouTube about this guy kicking it, and when Safe Carmen says, well, actually, it's stupid to kick in the street above a person's hands, above the height of a person's hands, because your kicks can basically kind of just drop into their hands. You have exceptions, but to take the chance on kicking high above the waist in the street, you know, why take that chance? You can get stomped to death. Well, you have to justify. You have to justify spending all that time loving kicking and talking about kicking. So now, oh, safe crime, he's such an asshole. He's such a creep. Ah, thumbs down. See, I never could afford that. I never could afford that, you see. So I started boxing when I was nine. By the time I was 11, I was straight with what fighting was. By the time I was 11, I was straight with what fighting was. I, you could not tell me to do anything that was exotic, anything that was crazy, anything that took fine motor skills. I was not going to do it because I had been learning how to box in the streets. So I knew what worked and what did not work by the time I was 11. Okay, And that was because I was only average height. 
I wasn't tall. So let me give you an example of defense, right? Let's look at defense. There are people who say, well, blocking punches to the head, and how do you block punches to the head? Let me tell you something. It's 2018. I developed this defense that I use right now with my students in 2018. The defense I teach people when the, the first two months that they come into my school, all right, that defense, I've been doing that since 1977. That defense, I have the defense I teach in 2018. No, 76. 76, right? 76. I was 15 years old when I wrote down and developed the defense that I teach right now in 2018, right? I'm 56 years old. I have some stitches here, some stitches here, you know, a, a gap tooth, had a couple broken ribs. But basically, I've been in a few battles in my day. I mean, I'm fairly well behaved today. Haven't been in any real skirmishes, bare knuckle skirmishes for at least about 25 years, right? But the fact of the matter is, I've had my share of battles with gloves, without, without gloves, in the street, in the gym, in the dojo, right? And I will tell you, I will tell you, if I didn't have a defense, I couldn't look like this and be 56. Okay, so here we go. I've had that defense since 1976. And it's the same defense that since at, in 2018 I teach people when they walk in the door, okay? Now, if I wasn't 5'7", I probably wouldn't have developed that defense. I probably certainly wouldn't have developed the defense as early as I did. Why? Because I'm 5'7". At 5'7", listen, where are you going to punch someone who's 5'7"? Where are grown men going to try to punch somebody who's 5'7"? Right here. Right here. So me being 5'7 enabled me and forced me, forced me, right, to get a defense, a matter of defense, a way of defending, a method of defending that I could defend bare knuckle if I needed to. Not just gloves, bare knuckle, a way of defending, a way of blocking straight punches, uppercuts, hooks, a way of defending myself, getting in, getting out, getting to the side, getting to the back of my opponent. They're able to do that and take a minimal amount of punishment. Because avoiding punishment ain't going to happen. I don't even teach people that. right? That's why they have to sign a waiver. I don't teach people to, to avoid punishment. I teach people to minimize the punishment. To keep them in the game. To keep them in the fight if that's what they have to do. All right, That's it. I don't sell snake oil. But me being 5'7 forced me to learn that defense. 5-7 also forced me to have a sense of urgency. A sense of urgency. All right? So, guy, one time I was 15 years old. I was 5-7, right? Or at least close to 5-7, maybe 5-6, right? At the time, hadn't finished growing, right? Growing, right? So the guy I was fighting was about 5-11, close to 6 foot. He was big for his size. He was about 18, or 3 years older than I was, something like that, right? So he didn't have much success standing up. So he goes and he drops his center of gravity. He's trying to take me down. Now, I don't have the three T's. I don't have the three T's, what I call three T's today. I don't have the target, I don't have the tools, and I don't have the torque. I don't have the target, don't have the tools, and don't have the torque. So, by target, I mean I don't have the ability to punch him in the front of his face. All right? The people like the front of the face, right? They, they still do. They don't really go for the ears and things like that too much. And they should, but, you know, they want the face. So I didn't have the target that I wanted, right? Because he had put his head right here. No, he's trying to take me down. His head was against my side. I didn't have the tools. I didn't have the tools back then. You know, you want to punch. You just want to punch. I couldn't, like, punch him because his head's right there. And I didn't have the torque. I couldn't get the torque behind my body. To get power, you need torque and distance. You need those kind of, you need those, at least those two variables, okay? You need a target. You need, you need a torque. And you need and you need distance. Okay. So I didn't have the three T's though. I didn't have the three T's. I didn't have the target, the tools, or the torque. So I'm trying to get this guy off of me. He is trying to lift me up and pick me up. So what I have to do now, picture his head right here. His head is here. His face is down, pointing down. He's trying to take me down. I lower my center of gravity. Now I know if he gets gets me down, he's gonna stomp me. I mean, I know people might say, "Well, wait, won't stomp you, safe?" Well, if you know anything about a crowd, a crowd, and what a crowd does to the psyche, 
You know that's my thing. You know the psyche is my thing, right? Okay. Well, the psyche, what the crowd does to the psyche makes people do things. No, he would have gotten me down to stop me. He wasn't trying to knock me out. He wasn't having much success doing that. In fact, he was close to getting knocked out himself, right? So he closed in on me. Why? He was closing on me so he wouldn't have to try to trade punches with me. He wants to get me down and stop me, stop my brains out. So I know this. Okay, up until this point, all I ever thought to do was punch people. That's ever I, all I ever thought to do was punch people. First 15 years of my life, just punch, 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 just box, box, box. You know, that's it. Okay, but the guy, I don't know, I can't grab him anywhere. I don't see anywhere I can punch him. So I just reach over. I reach over and I grab his eyelids. I grab his eyelids. I pull his, his head up, right, and I get this particular hand and I grab him with a C-clamp. I grab him with a C-clamp in his jaw, right? In his, in his neck. And I'm doing this. So as I do that, I know he has to do one of three things. He either has to let me go completely. He has to adjust his position. Or he has to loosen his grip. Again, I know he has to do one of three things. And I'm prepared for all three. He either has to let me go. Release his grip adjust his grip or adjust his position. Either way, I'm getting out of there, right? Because I'm making him so uncomfortable, he can't stay where he is, which is my goal. So I'm going like this. I got my eyes. I got his head like this, and my fingers are in his eyes, and this one is in his neck, and I'm forcing his head up, and I'm dropping my center of gravity. Hopefully, I'm in a camera, and finally, finally, he tries to loosen his grip he loses his grip so he can switch his head to the other side. And as soon as he does, my elbows drop down. I push my weight, my hips back. He comes up because he has to come up. I just cover myself and we're back standing up. Right? Now, had I been 5'7", he quite likely would not have tried to take me down. Had I been 6 feet to his 5'10", or his 5'11", he probably wouldn't have tried to take me down at that particular point. He certainly probably would not have gotten that low down on my hip. But me being 5'7", he thought that his best chance was to get me down. He assumed that I didn't weigh that much, although we were maybe about the same weight because I had some size on me with wise. But he tried to take me down. Now, me being 5'7", forced me, forced me to gouge. It forced me to try to crush his larynx, right? Now, this is in around 1976. Around 1976, I am doing combatives in 1976 at a time when people thought that was fighting like a girl. When people thought that gripping somebody, trying to pull somebody's hair, or trying to crush their larynx, or trying to face rake them, that was a way a man didn't fight. I was doing this in 1976, right? This was long before most of the people talking about combatives today were even doing it. Many of the people weren't even, weren't even training in the martial arts at that point. But why? Why did I do it? Sense of urgency. I had no choice. I was 5'7". So, I've always looked and said the reason why my self-protection self method works like it works is because of me being 5'7". Now, I want to tell you about a situation. Right? Situation that happened... Uh, about started, like I said, about a week ago, two weeks ago, and culminated last week. And this will help you understand how serious I am about my training and why I kind of don't care about people who are kicking at the air and people who are laying on their backs and people are doing these kind of, it just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't phase me at all, all right? Here's the thing. When I am teaching someone defense, I use minimal equipment, minimal equipment, I allow them to see if they can hit me. Because if they see, if they try to hit me without anything being rehearsed, then they believe in that method that I've been doing for 40 years now. All right? Okay. So there was one particular time I'm sparring with one of my students, sparring with one of my students, and I slipped one thing and I came up and I miscalculated and he hit me in the mouth. Right? He hit me in the mouth. Now they have orders. To not hold back. My students have orders to not hold back. In the beginning, I just punch them in the body. 
I just go to the body and about 50% to the body. I don't punch my students in the head, no matter how big they are. When they get advanced, I will go a little bit to the head, but I never go all out with my students. A per, a, one of my students can train me for 30 years, and I will never, ever go all out to try to knock them out. I just don't do that. They, however, have orders. My students have orders to not hold back on me because I need to know if what I've taught them is actually what I think they should be learning. So one of my students, a Hindu guy, right, who st shall remain nameless, right, he hits me in the mouth and he loosens one of my teeth. He loosens one of my teeth. Okay. We don't stop. We keep going. He didn't even know he loosened it. This was two weeks ago. Another one of my students comes in, right, last week, and we're working on getting ourselves up from the bottom when someone has a full mouth. Okay. So my thing is, I tell them, okay, I'm going to get you off of me, and I want you to resist. That's what I do when I'm training my students. Okay, very minimal rehearsal. I, I just don't like that. How are they going to trust me if everything they do, I have to tell them to do it? Then it's a fake. I'm selling them snake oil. So I bump, and I just bump for a reason, to get him somewhere else. So as I bump, and he, 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 he braces himself, I just grab his flesh on the side. I grab his flesh on the side and I twist it. As I twist it, he screams because I'm twisting his fat. When I twist him, he screams and I buck him and turn him over. Now when I turn him over, he's trying to get back into the full mount and he palms me in the face. Now when he palms me in the face, it's by mistake. But he palms me in the face trying to get back into the full mount that I bucked him off of. Okay, now when he palms me in the face, what do you think happens with that tooth that was loose? Comes out. It comes out. The tooth comes out. One of my students loosens the tooth. Another student the following week knocks the tooth out. I just took the tooth and spit it. He heard it roll, and we just kept going. The blood's trickling down my mouth. We kept going. I get some paper, some paper towel. I put it in my mouth. He says, what happened? I go and I pick up the tooth. I said, to knock my tooth out. And he's so apologetic, he's so apologetic. But when we're done, he's giving me a ride home, and he almost has an accident. Now, why does he have an accident? He almost doesn't have an accident. He almost has an accident. Now, why do you think that? He tells me the reason why he almost had the accident was because he was looking at me when he should have been looking at the traffic. So I asked him, well, why were you looking at me? He said, because I knocked your tooth out. The blood is running out of your mouth, and you just keep training like it's nothing. And I told him, what I teach is self-protection. I teach street fighting. It's my life. If I'm going to be teaching everybody with 18 and 20 ounce gloves, then I'm not teaching them reality. I teach as much as I can teach and remain alive and relatively healthy. Losing a tooth is relatively healthy. That is my life. That is Safe Karma's training. That is the core of the UMA Fight Camp and of the new channel that will be coming up shortly. That's why I'm dismissive of people kicking at the air, laying on their backs, and thinking because they're commentators, therefore they know something about fighting. That's where I'm coming from. Okay? Uma Fight Camp. Save Carmen. Train hard, train smart. See you in the next video.